All right, Rachel. So that was a pretty cool episode. Yeah. What was one of your takeaways, or what was one of the things that you loved the most <laughs> mm. about our last our episode we just did, and that you yeah. guys are going to get to hear with Zasha Smith, who is here in Hawaii as a Hawaii. real estate investor, and she invests all over the place. And she's got some really, really, really great strategies. And she mm. started off with literally hundred thousand dollars in debt, yeah. and now in just a few short years has become a multimillionaire through real mm. estate. And so we get to sh- in this episode we get to share your story. I just liked how confident she is, yeah. and she's kind of like that slow, steady, mm-hmm. you know, uh, p- person in real estate mm-hmm. that really gets to figure out, she's figured it out in multiple different strategies. And a lot of times people pick one strategy and they go deep. She's figured out a way to do a lot of different strategies mm-hmm. that I really like. And so you guys are going to absolutely love this episode. Love it is my it. first ever episode co-hosting with <laughs> this girl right here. She asked some great questions. Yeah. So if you liked how she did... Uh, then if you liked how <laughs> Zasha Smith did, then please share the episode. If you like how my wife did, drop her a comment. Yeah. And uh, let's see if she's got a future in podcast co-hosting with Sam here. What, we'll what see were some about of the that. things you loved about the episode? Yeah, I loved her spirit, indomitable spirit. I loved that she uh, is building wealth and not only building wealth for herself and her, for her family, but she's extending that to her community. She's going back, giving back, mm, creating a, yeah. a 5013C and more of the philanthropist and just taking what she's learned and has applied in her life yeah. back to the community through affordable housing. She's solving a crisis that we both believe in very yeah. much um, and are dedicated to solving and just making a dent yeah. in that space as well. Yeah. So I, I love that. I loved her um, courage and her go-getter-ness. Yeah. I don't know the word for it, but she's just uh, seems like a really great girl. Seems like she's really committed to this process and uh, in her own journey. And again, just taking other people along that journey is with her. I love that you said that because it's so true. You meet people that are super wealthy in real estate, have millions yeah. and millions and millions of dollars, but that really doesn't matter if mm. they're just a terrible person. Yeah. You know? And or they're Sasha not Smith, doing anything with it. Or they're not doing anything cool with it or they don't have, yeah, maybe not cool, but they don't, they're not, they don't, you're not using it for a greater purpose. Mm. And so what we love is connecting with real estate investors mm-hmm. like Zasha in this episode who have a mission behind it, yes. who stand behind it and are out there going, teaching, training, doing great things in the world with their money. So check this episode out. You guys will love it and share it with someone who needs to get their butt going in Mm -hmm. real estate. Well, we are so excited to meet with you and hang out with you and do a podcast with you. This is our first podcast interview together. So we're new so to the we're new it. to the yeah, <laughs> we're new grace. to the joint interviewing. <laughs> and actually yesterday was our first podcast that we did. Interviewed reverse. together. We got interviewed mm-hmm. together. So we're working on our podcasting skills. But yeah. we're so excited you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. The one and only Zasha Smith. <laughs> so Zasha, I got us I want to start off just by asking you a question. You know, I think your story is so inspiring. I was sharing mm. with you earlier that I think everybody's got a story. Some people have you know, a great story. And I think you do a really great job of communicating your story. And one of the things that I think is really powerful that people can relate to, especially now, is you started in debt, mm-hmm. right? Your story you know, starts $100,000 in debt to a multimillionaire through real estate. So I want to take you back to when you were in debt. <laughs> oh, God. It's probably been a while Please since you thought about that. But tell us a little bit about, because you know, this is going to be us learning about your story too. And so tell us a little bit about where were you in your life when you were in debt? What was your mindset around that time? And and what was it? I don't know if you can even maybe take us back to a moment where you decided, hey, something needs to change mm-hmm. or you wanted to be on a different path than you were on. Can you tell us about that? Well, so I grew up here on Maui and lived in affordable housing, was raised by a single mom who was living paycheck to paycheck. There was me, my brother, my sister. And from a very young age, we started trying to contribute to the household. So we'd sell spam musubis after school. We would, um, you know, buy candies from like Costco or a wholesale area and then sell them at school too to our friends. But we definitely had that in us from the start of knowing that, you know, it does take money in order to get the things that you want. And so I think when you come from humble beginnings, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to be in charge of your finances, you know, you don't have money, but as far as like managing your money, you're not very aware of that. So Mm. I graduated from Maui high school, put myself through college. And of course, we know college is very expensive, but I knew that I'd wanted a different path for my life than the one that I grew up with. Mm. And so going to college, um, really taught me how to manage money. But then I also got into a lot of debt just because of the cost of books, of courses. And yeah. along the way, I had my first daughter while I was a sophomore in college. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's Second crazy. year. Yeah. yeah. So when I was had her, luckily on campus, they had a daycare. Mm. 
And so I would ride my beach That's cruiser cool. from my apartment to drop her off before I went to class. And so I racked up a little bit of debt from that as well, just having to pay for all those stuff. Open up credit cards. It's so easy to open up credit cards sure. when you're in college. <laughs> like they had them all over they campus. Want you to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that really just opened up my eyes to like leveraging credit. But then also that put you in a lot of debt. Yeah. So it was almost a good part of that. The mm-hmm. good part of that was like, hey, I can use, which I know something you're big on teaching, OPM. I can use other people's money for right. stuff. <laughs> like maybe you weren't using that at that time to buy real estate, but right. you, were, you were using it. That's yeah. crazy. How did you know? You said you said you knew you wanted a different path. And I think, you know, what was it about you? or How did you know you wanted a different path than that? Just kind of seeing my mom struggle and right. then living in an expensive market like Hawaii, right. where you know the average cost of homes now are one point two million dollars. Yeah. I was like, "How the heck am I going to move home and be able to afford to live there?" So I knew I had to, you know, the the common way of thinking is I have to get a high paying profession, like become a doctor, a lawyer, engineer. And so after I had my daughter, I realized, okay, I better be one of those three because mm. if not, I can't move home. Right. And so I became a, a civil engineer, moved home, and worked as an engineer for 10 years. But I was still in debt. I, I right. still was not able to pay off all of my debt, even though I had a really good job because right. the cost of living here is so high. Right. And so one day, it was a Saturday, I had to go into work. This is after working for 10 years as an engineer, moving up to project manager in charge of, you know, $20 million, $50 million projects where we're building shopping centers and renovating hotels and building subdivisions here across Hawaii. It really got me to thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm really like slaving away and I'm on a salary. My salary was only mm-hmm. about almost $70,000 a year. Yeah, it's like six grand a month or something. And I, once I started going in on Saturdays because my boss was like, hey, we have this deadline, like we got to get this built, started going in and then I would go in on Monday and then she was like, oh, and don't worry about the other stuff that you didn't finish. I got that done yesterday. And I was like, that's going to be my life. Like going to be working seven, seven days a week and getting paid wow. the same amount. And I just didn't want that to be me and my husband. What really hit me was one day when I came home after working, you know, on a Saturday and he was like, Hey, where have you been all day? I'm like, Oh, I had to go to work. You know, he's like, Hey, I don't mind helping out with the kids. He had his own business. So he had a lot more flexibility, but for him, he said, they're getting the best of you and we're getting the rest of you. And I think that is the moment that really hit me like, oh my gosh, you're right. And I'm choosing this life. My mom didn't have a choice. So that took me back to my childhood when I felt like that towards my mom, like, why are you working so much? Why don't we have you around? But I had made a better life for myself, but I was choosing to be away from them. So Yeah, I get goosebumps on that part of your story because I think we follow Tony Robbins a lot. And Tony Robbins talks about how like all decisions come from this balance of like pain and pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. And when pain becomes great enough, mm-hmm. or sometimes pleasure becomes great enough, that's what gets us to make decisions. And so you had to reach, like, that emotional threshold of, like, mm-hmm. no. Yeah. yeah. No, no, right? another day. And, and some people listening to this probably don't even, haven't gotten there yet, mm-hmm. right? They're mm-hmm. still maybe in the W-2, or they're still in that grind, but, but they know that there's something more. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think what's interesting is we can make a decision ahead of that pain and get ourselves to take that action to move forward. So how did your real estate journey start then after you finally were like, no, not enough? Where did you go? You're 10 years in a career. You have a a 12-year-old at this point probably or a 13-year-old? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so after that, it really got me to thinking, man, I really got to make a change then. And my husband brought it to my attention. I, I do need to shift my thinking from like, you know, this is a secure job. Like this is what I went to college for and I fought so hard to be, to have this better life, but is it really better, right? It's not really. So I started Googling, you know, on the internet, how to quit my job and get rich, you know, like everybody else. And (laughs) real estate kept popping up. And it was so hard for us to buy our home. I was like, how are all these people buying rental? They must have come from money. But the more I educated myself, the more I started listening to podcasts, I was like, oh, they they started with no money. And so that just opened up my my mind to 
trying to be around other people that were do, already successful in real estate. So I learned about local meetups happening here. I l- started learning about events and just started going and surrounding myself. Mm-hmm. And after I joined a mentorship, it really gave me direction into mm-hmm. how I could actually make this into something that was full time. And mm-hmm. so I started learning how you could buy properties off market because right here it's very limited market. And so drove for dollars, you know, cold call, door knocked, and got my first deal at a foreclosure auction. Mm. And it was a condo. We purchased it, and in 30 days, we did the renovation. We sold it in 15 days uh, to a cash buyer, and we netted $103,000 wow. in 45 days. And your brain went, <laughs> 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 And I was making wow. $70,000 as an engineer working 70 hours a week. 365 days, and I did this one <laughs> deal, and it made me more in 45 days year. than yeah. in a year. So that was the, okay, I better do this one time. <laughs> I only got to get one of these deals a year in order to replace my income. So. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about that, actually. I was going to ask you what your first deal was. Actually, my, my first deal was a condo, too, a foreclosure <laughs> condo. So that's funny that there's, there's something that goes in there. Mm-hmm. So you went, you started, you, you drove for dollars. You started going to meetups. You started doing all of these things. Uh, I know that one of your first properties you ended up house hacking and and what we would call co-living as well. Can you tell us about that deal and kind of how you got into that? Yeah, so prior to the house that I live in with my husband now, uh, when I first moved back to Maui in uh, 2017, after I graduated from college, I was living in a condo, renting one, and then my mom was as well. And we we're both at that time single mom. So I had my daughter uh, graduated from college. She um, had my brother, and my sister. And so when I talked to my mom, she was like, hey, I heard about this down payment assistance program that's going to help with putting the money down to buy a home, but mm-hmm. I don't qualify on my own. You know, maybe we should buy something together. My first thinking was like, oh, hell no, I don't want to move back with my mom. <laughs> the second thing <laughs> was like, okay, this is a great opportunity because we are both paying rent to someone else. So let's work together. So we qualify for the loan together and we bought a duplex. So a three bedroom, two bath on one side. And then another unit was a two bedroom, one bath. And my mom had lived in it for a while and I stayed there and she ended up moving because of a job. And so she was like, you know, if you can just cover the whole thing, then that's fine. I don't need anything. So I said, okay. She ended up moving and I rented that side um, for about 1800 a month. And that covered my mortgage. And then I ended up renting a room on my side because that time it was only me and my daughter. So we only really needed two bedrooms. The third one I rented um, to a friend for about $400 a month, which covered our utilities. So I was basically living for free. And both of those, if you had moved out of that and rented those other two rooms, it probably would have been a decently cash flowing property. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's the house hacking model. That's so mm-hmm. cool. So you have you flipped was your first ever deal. Yeah. You did co-living, you did house hacking with your mom, super cool strategy. <laughs> and cool that you did it with your mom. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, family can get yeah. difficult. But, yeah. <laughs> I have seven, yeah, yeah. I have seven yeah. brothers and sisters. I know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we've worked together a little bit too. It can be it can be challenging. What are your, you know, for someone that's just getting into real estate, what are some of your favorite strategies for beginners to start in real estate? I know you talk a lot about that on, in, to your following on ways that they can get started, maybe even ways they can get started with zero money down. But what are, what are some of your favorite ways? Because what, what I find unique about you is that you've actually done a lot of different strategies, right? Like we were talking in the lobby about tiny homes and you were talking, and then you, I know you just bought this 32 lot development that I want to actually dive into in a, in a few minutes, you know, and, and, and that's going to be kind of, or affordable housing here on the island. That's here on the island, right? So we'll talk about that. But like, that's pretty cool. Like rarely do I meet someone that has so like experience in so many different areas of real estate, right? Development, all the things that we just mentioned. So how do you recommend people just first get started into this space if they're in the place you were in and they want to take their life, take their finances to the next level? Well, I would say, well, number one is to look at your financial situation and what your risk tolerance is. And from there, you know, budget, because that's where it all starts is knowing what your income is and expenses. 
from there, you can say, okay, how much do I actually have to start investing in real estate? Are you employed or not? Can you get a loan? Like all those factors matter. So one, you know, you could get started wholesaling. But I mean, if you do qualify for a home like I did with my mom, buy something and then rent out, like you mentioned, the co-living, rent out a few rooms, rent out, you know, another unit if you don't feel comfortable living with people. But a lot of people don't know that you can use um, a conventional loan, an FHA loan, to buy a property that has four units on it. So that would be my favorite because you are you kind of get a little taste of being a landlord um, and then also get to oversee the property. But you also could potentially, like I did, live for free, like not have any expenses so or even cash flow. But we are in an expensive market. So for me, for us, it's a little bit different here as well. Yeah. So do you recommend flipping for someone's first start? Just out of curiosity, I know that was your start. I do um, because if, especially if you're in an expensive market, there's a lot more um, potential to make money, like a big like amount of money. Of cash. Yes, yeah. yeah. So if you're starting off with no money or you're trying to replace your job income, because we all know with rentals, it, takes, it actually takes time in order to start really cash flowing and seeing the benefits. So if you have time and you, you like your job, then leverage the conventional loans and buy a four-unit property, live in it. And I actually really do like the strategy of living someplace for two years, you know, fixing it up and then selling it as well, because mm-hmm. then you can save money on taxes, 250000 if you're single and then 500,000 up to if you're married. And so you do live in flip style as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that. That's because that's kind of like a long term flip kind of Mm -hmm. thing, but it also provides for your housing. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I think what's interesting is you're saying like, you know, if budgeting is where you need to start, then what then a lot of people's largest budget item is their housing. So like if you can nix that or make that free or reduce that in some way, you're winning. Mm -hmm. Right. But how does the strategy work? Because I, I hear very few people talk about this. How does the strategy work? How do you think about it of like buying a house, living in it, and then selling it? I mean, now being, you know, four years into real estate investing, I would say, I mean, try to keep as many homes as you can. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of flips that I've done <laughs> where I'm like, man, if I would have just held on to it, yeah. even though it didn't potentially cash flow at the time, the appreciation that I know happens here is crazy. Like homes go up a hundred, two hundred thousand sometimes each year. So, you know, if your strategy is cash flow or appreciation or both, I mean in the long term you're gonna make out by keeping a property, if it makes sense. Of of all the things that you've done, Zasha, that we've mentioned so far, and we'll dive into a couple more mm-hmm. in a moment, how do you make the determination on whether or not you're gonna do a real estate deal? This is actually a very personal question I want to ask you. Like Okay, so you get the land or the tiny homes. Or the, what 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 goes through your brain when you're thinking, I want to do that real estate deal or no, that doesn't fit Sasha's criteria on what makes a good real estate deal? How do you process that? How much time is it going to take? That is essentially mm, that's yeah. every day. How much time a week? How much time a month? You know, as far as rental properties, I have several out of state as well that are managed by a property management company. And the ones here, I self-manage because I like to be reminded of kind of where I come from. So my my 11 rentals here are basically rented to people on rental assistance or Section 8. And I like to stay connected to them and also check on the properties. But um, it really helps me keep my feet on the ground. So I like that. But moving forward, yeah, moving forward, especially after last year, I think a lot of people had lost money in the market or didn't predict the interest rates to go as high as they did. So there was a few properties that I wanted to keep, but then we had to sell. And that just made me realize that I need to be more efficient with whatever my portfolio is right now and really think, okay, which ones are giving me the most return on my time and my money? Mm -hmm. And so- Moving forward, I was like, okay, I'm not really going to do any more single family homes. I'm going to f- more so focus on bigger projects. So we ended up um, partnering on an RV park in the mainland, in the mainland, <laughs> in um, the continental in Hawaii. US. They, they, right? call the, they call the United States the mainland. I just learned that today. But we start, started focusing on bigger projects that would produce more cash flow. It will take a lot more time in the end. But as far as my own individual times, I think focusing more so on partnerships and 
the long-term benefits of that. And so we also did hmm. start a fund for um, syndications. I invested in, in 2022 into four different syndications. So those are apartment building deals um, as a co-GP. Yeah. And that really took like not as much time as I thought it was going to be, but I did partner on a lot of those bigger deals. So for me, that's more worth investing in the long yeah. run is something that's not going to take so much of my time, something that's a little bit more passive, but I'm still actively keeping tabs on it and actively invested and going on to the meetings and in touch with the partners. And so the 32 yeah. lots is going to be different though. That Yeah, let's let's talk about those a little bit. That's yeah, really cool. that's And cool. I love your answer, by the way, because I think it's so yeah. many people, you know, talk about, I, I would have thought, you know, well, how much money it makes me. But you, the first thing that came out of your mouth was, no, like, how much of my time, you know, because money you can always get back. You can make, there'll be some deals that'll make more money and less money. But ultimately, like, you will never get a cent. You'll never, a cent. You'll never get a cent of your time back. You'll never get a second of your time back. <laughs> Coin and so that's, that's really a cool thing that that's your, one of your biggest criteria. But yeah, I want to talk yeah. about, and I know you've got some per, more personal yeah. questions that you want to ask for her. So I want to hear about this too. We'll Let's dive into the real estate. I have a couple more real it. estate specific questions, and I'll flip it over to Rachel to ask. Yeah. The nitty gritty questions. We didn't ask what was off limits in this podcast. Oh, snap. Uh, <laughs> Tell us about the 32 units. I'm excited for this project. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we actually, I started partnering with a, another real estate <laughs> investor who we uh, definitely aligned in our goals, mm. um, our integrity, our passion. Mm. So I'm at a point in my life right now, I'm probably netting about 26000 a month from my rental properties and passive income. That's awesome. Oh, and so thank you. Yeah. So I'm comfortable. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me now, I reevaluated things and said, okay, now how can I have a, ma a bigger impact on my community? Because that's always been the goal. And that's why we started renting out to people in Section 8 because I lived in low-income housing. So it's more so how can I still give back more but sustaining what I already have? And so the 32 Lots came about. Another real estate investor brought the opportunity to me and said, hey, I – there's this really great deal on these 32 lots and I want to build affordable housing on it. You know, he more so does the project management side. He's really involved in the construction. He has probably 30 other projects going on right now um, on the big island. So it's on another island, but he is able to still keep them at affordable pricing because he's able to keep the um, construction costs down. So he also came from humble beginnings and he was like, Hey, if we partner together, like same thing, he's, on my Instagram, he's like, I really love what I see and I want to, you know, work with you on something. So we ended up putting in the funds to buy the lots. And so now we're going through the process of forming a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, bringing oh, in wow. grant money wow. and cool. other, you know, just learn. I've never done affordable housing like at scale like this. So it is will be a learning pro process. But we did have a call this morning with another uh, entity that's going to help us build a nonprofit. So just putting all the puzzle pieces together, but our whole goal is to build these 32 individual homes and uh, have them available for people on Section 8 or rental assistance and work with another nonprofit company to place and house more residents, more locals. So wow. cool. I really love your heart for that. So beautiful. And obviously, like, what yeah. the three days we've been in Hawaii, average home price being $1.2 mm -hmm. we get the, like, that's a huge issue. It's a huge issue in the mainland. Mm -hmm. I can use that so quickly after you used it. But like, it's a huge issue here too. Yeah. And we've seen that. I know you were saying after the fires here, there was like 2,000 people homeless living on the beach. Yeah. And so there, there's there's a lot of momentum there. That's really cool. I love that. I love that project. So I'd like to kind of talk about two more things and then we'll go to some other questions. But um, how in, one of the things you talk about a lot is uh, using other people's money and just kind of sharing how you've done that. And I know you mentioned just starting a fund, which is really cool. So for someone new at this game of real estate, could you talk about a little bit about is it important to start learning other people's, you know, how to use other people's money right away? Is that something you start further on into your journey? And what is the best ways to begin that journey into leveraging other people's monies? So for me, it was important that – I had a few deals under my belt before I took anyone else's money. Because it's one thing to lose your own money. It's another thing to lose someone else's money. So uh, for me, I did two deals before I started raising money from other people. But at that time, I had a really good job. I was kind of saving and paying off debt. So I decided to kind of restructure that a little bit. 
And but luckily, you know, I was very blessed to be able to run my numbers, be in an expensive market that kept going up and made more money than we had predicted on making on our deals because we run our numbers very conservatively. But in the end, I think it was just being comfortable with and confident in myself that I could consistently get good deals. So my third deal was another investor and it was actually during COVID. So a lot of investors had pulled out of the market because nobody knew where it was going. So that's why it was key for me to keep the network, keep in contact with people even throughout you know, my journey, just touching base with people. And so another investor who was fix and flipping, he was like, hey, I'm pulling out right now. And you know, um, if you find any deals, let me know. But I'm thinking about maybe possibly lending. And I was like, oh, I could use your money. <laughs> <laughs> so it, he had never lent before. I never borrowed anybody's money before. But we both understood how real estate investing worked, how fix and flip worked, how what a good deal looked like. And so the next deal that I found, I brought it to him. And I was like, hey, if you provide all the money, we can partner. He was like, oh, I don't know. It's COVID. Like, if I could just get a set return, I'll be fine. And so I was like, okay. I was like freaking out because I never raised money before. And I called my mentor and I was like, oh my God, what do I do? And I put together like a, a packet for him. And then I say, what what do I ask for as far as what, you know, he's going to get out of the deal? He's like, just leave it blank. Just see, you know, see what he says. And so initially I was like, oh yeah, after 10% and two points. And so after talking with him, we met for dinner. And what I realized was when you're raising money or funds, from people that already have money, it's more of like a trust factor. Like they have to, one, it has to be a really great deal, but also they have to just trust that you'll do the right thing. So after speaking to him, he's like, oh yeah, maybe 8% and and no points. I was like, okay. And this is for $560,000. So he funded the entire purchase price and the rehab. That's crazy. Yeah. So from that moment on, you were hooked. You were like, I like this. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> let's do so this. Zero of my own money in my third deal. And um, we ended up keeping it because when we ran the numbers, I said, hey, would you be flexible with waiting until I can get the refinance done? So that's another good thing about using other people's money or private money is that the terms can be negotiated. Um, it's a lot more flexible as long as you keep that relationship and communication open. But from there on, I tried to do as many deals as I could using other people's money and just run my numbers really conservative. Yeah, so it starts with the deals and the criteria. Mm-hmm. You had you had a track record at that point. Yeah. And you, I love that you have the confidence in yourself. That's super important. Well, and then if you're just starting off, I would highly suggest, and you don't have any money, but you want to raise money, say, for your first deal, partner with an experienced investor, whether that be with you and then bringing on someone who has the money or partner with them on that deal where they get equity. So a lot of people, oh, I don't want to give up like 50%. It's like, but then you wouldn't get the deal. So, uh, and also their knowledge. And someone who's experienced, who's been through a few deals can know how to pivot because there will be challenges. Of course, that I was like, I made 103 off my first thousand off my first deal, but it wasn't easy. There was so many challenges but I was able to get through it because I had a good job. I'm married. You know, my husband is a um, plumbing contractor. So he had some contacts where if the tile guy didn't show up, he's like, hey, I have my other friend and you can call him. I was in charge of managing the project myself, but at least I had those things to rely on. So if you are brand new to this, don't know anybody that's doing it, it, it can get difficult. And I would hate for someone to lose money on a deal just because they don't want to give up some part of the equity. Yeah, that's a great point. Which brings me to kind of my last my last question for you on the real estate specific side. Mm-hmm. You know, I see a lot of beginners wanting to partner with people mm-hmm. and you know, frankly, maybe getting into partnerships that they shouldn't have gotten into mm-hmm. or them going bad or them getting into a fight or having a falling out and now you've got a partnership and it's got this real estate deal in the middle of them and they're trying to figure all that out, right? Mm-hmm. And so what would you say are some of your criteria for choosing a good partner? Because you've obviously, mm. you have Absolutely. partners, you've kind of, it sounds like you've done that really well. Mm-hmm. How do you think through that? So I've partnered with probably about 17 different people over the last couple years. Probably only one or two of them, I would just not partner with that person anymore. 
But I think what... It's a great ratio. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great ratio. <laughs> Percentage-wise, that's good. We still made money. I just didn't like the way that they kind of maneuvered. Um, and then maybe vice versa, right? We just didn't align on a few things. But I feel like if you have hard conversations up front, like, hey, if what are the roles and expectations of both parties? Like, okay, are you just bringing the money and that's all you do? Or do you bring the money and you manage the realtor or any of the documents or keep track of the expenses? Like, what exactly is their role and then what is yours? Are you the boots on the ground project manager? Are you coordinating um, with all the contractors or buying materials? Or what exactly are, is the expectations on both of your guys' parts? And then, hey, what if the initial goal is to fix and flip, but then we the market goes down and we have to refinance or something into a rental. What will that look like? So I think just having hard conversations up front and I know a lot of people who partner like, oh yeah, that's my friend. Oh yeah, they seem like a good person. Let's partner. Yeah. It's like, no, let's have these conversations. Mm. And now partnering on these multi-million dollar deals, it's like, no, okay, let's get background checks on each other. Let's uh, mm. talk over our... Um, personal financial statements. So we each get to see where each person is financially. So we know, okay, what can we realistically do or pivot to? And it is difficult to like bring up those conversations or have someone agree to those types of things. But I think when there is a lot of money on the line, it it needs to be done. But everything in writing. And everything in writing. Clarity is power. It's in writing. Yeah. I got to ask though, how does the... <laughs> How, the background check conversation. How do you have that one? Is that just, you just come out of the gate with that one? Like, hey, I, this is a <laughs> criteria because <laughs> I like it. Right. Yeah. I did a background check and a credit check on my husband before okay. when he was my boyfriend. Okay. So Unbeknownst to him. <laughs> just like, no, hey, baby, you're clear. Right. <laughs> so when we, so before we moved in, I was like, hey, you know, I have a daughter already. And um, at that time I was house hacking with my mom and yeah, he was yeah. my boyfriend. And so I said, before you move in, like, I need to do a background and credit check on you because I I love you, but I need to know <laughs> what else there what is, you know, what else I'm dealing with. But it was good because I actually found out that he had a, a repo on his credit. And then he also had like a Macy's and a Navy cards. He's like, I'd never been there before, but his sister had had his social security oh, number. So oh my gosh. it was a good thing. We cleared it all up. And, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So How about that's that? benefits. Crazy. I like that. <laughs> you know, his credit. Helping his people credit, clean up their credit. Right? Yeah. His credit went from 480 <laughs> to, you know, 750 <laughs> because of me. You know? <laughs> and it later helped in the long run. So right. We're With our refinancing. The dating right. part of this episode. <laughs> Background check, credit check, new criteria. Yeah. So that that's exactly. where it's not it's not it's difficult for me to have yeah. those conversations yeah. because I say, yeah. hey, look, I yeah. do this all the time. I even did it with my husband. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is just how she maneuvers. Okay, man, I like it. I think you're right. I think some of those hard conversations early could on. save yeah. early on could save yeah. so much heartache. Right. And the fact that you've kind of you come across so sweet, so yes. loving too. I think yeah, you have it's a very nice. <laughs> That's other great. people, but <laughs> man, fill this out. Give me your social. Here you go. I heard something. I love, else. I, I, I love all of your success. I want we want to transition yeah. here a little bit because we want to honor your time as well. Yeah. And big shout out to Brandon Turner for letting Let us use his studio, studio here yeah. in Mouth. So great. We love it. But uh, Rachel, I know you have yeah. some more person some of the personal yeah. questions. I love it too. I mean, I love your story. It's incredible what the success you have. So congratulations. And uh, I want to go back and listen to all of this all over again. And uh, yeah, Sasha, why don't you tell me, I, as a woman, I'm sure there's been challenges. Um, you know, I, I used to say when we when uh, Sam and I first got our start, you know, I'd be the only woman in the room at, at most conversations. So I'm sure you've experienced that as well and, and your journey. And now there are more investor group meetups and uh, masterminds for women. But what challenges uh, have you faced in the real estate investing world, being a woman specifically? I think it's more so the fact that people, you know, they see me and I'm a small island girl and like colorful flower and um, they think, okay, she's, she's okay. But they don't see the other side of like my portfolio or what I've done. But honestly, it hasn't been that challenging for me. And I think because I was an engineer before this, so I've been around like my entire workforce, my 
supervisor was a woman, so they were very open, but like they were all older Japanese guys. And so for me, it's it's almost easier to break the ice because I'm a little bit funny and quirky and different. And a lot of people, yeah, relate to that or like, oh, she's interesting. So I think a lot of people too just are more so open now day and age to women. Um, but I just surround myself by people that I get along with or want to work with. So if there is someone where I'm getting the vibes or the feeling like they're not taking me seriously, then I just keep moving on and I find another resource or I find another person to work with that's going to want to work with me. Yeah, maybe the, the more the feminine, it's almost like a soft approach. You know, it's like a little softer. You can go in there and then <laughs> and then like come out with you what use you it use it to your advantage and come out what you're really here for. And right. it's more approachable. Uh, yeah, I, I learned in like the construction world. It was like almost like a little bit more like undermine and then you start talking. It sounds like with your engineer and the skill set you had, you had that language and you led with that and people saw, oh, okay, this woman really knows what she's talking about here and, and then they take you a little bit more serious, uh, more seriously. Um, what books, if any, uh, what book, maybe one book that uh, has meant a lot to you and has been pivotal, pivotal in your journey in the real estate world? Well, in real estate, I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah, or Robert yeah. Kiyosaki, everyone that just put things in layman terms and helped me understand. But more recently, uh, me and my husband read um, The Power of One More, I think by Ed Milet. And so he just talks about, you know, living life in the way that what if you only had like one chance? Or like you, this is your last say, or you only got to say, you know, someone passed away that you really love tomorrow. What did you say to them today? You know, what would you, kind of living your life without any regrets. I love that. And is there any quote or mantra that you live your life by? You talked about earlier how you live your life and the criteria you have for investing. What um, What's maybe something that you live your a sentence or statement that you live your life by now? Definitely build wealth while making a positive impact. That has definitely sums me up in one line, but I want people to know that having money isn't a bad thing. It's just what you decide to do with it. And I think a lot of times growing up, when people don't have money, they think of like rich people as bad. And you're viewed, like we were just had a conversation before this as well, about like investors being bad and having this negative con connotation. But if you share more, and that's why I'm so, I share a lot of it on social media because I want people to see like, hey, yes, you have to make money in order to build wealth, but you can also rent to people on Section 8. You can also provide affordable housing, someplace for people to live and do what you're really passionate about in the end if you have, if you don't have to have that financial stress on your shoulders. Yeah, and I love that you said it in that order because it's almost like we, we follow, we have a personal mentor and it's like if you can free yourself financially, then you can go back and give to the community and, and go beyond. And so I love the order, build wealth and have a generational and lasting impact. And I, I feel that from you. I feel this conversation. I feel like you're doing that, uh, living, breathing it. It's, it's very inspiring. Very inspiring. So as we wrap up here, Zasha, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much yeah, for your time. Yeah, I got to ask one question. And I want to talk about your mentorship program because I know you have a mentorship program. Yeah. I think you even you bring people here. Is that? Well, anyway, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about what your mentorship program is, how people can get in touch with you for yeah. that. And uh, But I want to just ask very directly, what do you – so one of the things that we're really sold out for is this co-living thing, which we've talked touched on this. But I want to give you an opportunity. What do you think of co-living or rent, the rent by the room strategy right now as a general strategy for people who are beginning? Mm -hmm. I think it's awesome to start with. And like I said, I did the house hacking. So I done like I we talked about co-living yeah. in college where you're renting out rooms mm -hmm. and just sharing the costs. But essentially, I wish I would have gone back and just bought something if I would qualified and then rented out the room. So I actually have a 17 year old daughter and she's graduating from high school this year. So Congrats. my plan with her is actually to do a co-living style, which is to buy a property. If she goes to Las Vegas, hopefully she will survive out there. But um, if she ends up going there either by a four unit property or buying a three bedroom home and then renting to her and her friends. So yeah. kind of give her that kickstart. But yeah. the co-living thing is, cool. is definitely 
high on the list if yeah. you're just getting started and, you know. Especially a single person, young people. We, Sam and I both, we talked offline about living in the homes um, ourselves. And, yeah. you know, you go back to the house and there's the light is left on and somebody else is there. And, you know, as a single young girl in a, in a town like, you know, city like Las Vegas, it could be overwhelming and scary. But to go knowing she's going back and she's going to be in a community of hopefully like-minded individuals and friends, um, it's probably reassuring as a mother to send her away. Well, tell us a little bit, uh, how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? And tell us a little bit about your mentorship program and how you're helping people get started in real estate through that. Instagram, huge on that, at invest with Sasha. I love to just share day-to-day things that I'm doing and just things that apply to a lot of different people and get them to think, shift their thinking into not like I can't do that, but like, how can I do it? Oh, she's doing it. Maybe I can try this or just giving you that little bit of inspiration. So that's why I love social media and it's free. And you're so, funny. Right. You're yeah. funny stuff too. I'm low key <laughs> funny. I, I, I definitely do have a sense of humor. Um, the other thing is that I realize here in Hawaii, especially A lot of people, there's not a lot of local people that are teaching how to start investing. And that comes from, you know, history of the way that Hawaii was taken over. And so for me, it's very important for the locals here to have a local mentor or someone that can show them the way and invest the right way, because there's definitely a different way that you could invest just thinking about profits. But now I want them to be thinking, hey, I want to invest so that I can then help my family. I can then provide more rentals for other local people or people on rental assistance. And so we started the Hui Mastermind, huimastermind.com. And it is strictly for people who are in Hawaii or from Hawaii who want to invest here. So whether that figure out how to buy a home for themselves, buy um, land, or even just figure out their own financial situation and how they can help their own families buy homes themselves is really what the goal of that is. And that's why I started doing different strategies, like the tiny homes, right? Just teaching other people here, like, hey, I know it's an expensive market, but if you have like a side yard or something, an area that you're not using, build an ohana, build in a cottage. We call it ohana here. (laughs) But a a cottage or put a tiny home on there. Like there is so many other ways instead of just people giving up like, oh, it's too expensive. I have to move away or it's too expensive. I can't buy a home. I just keep renting. It's like, okay, if you have family land or something, maybe put a few of these. They're like, you know, thirty to $40,000 and you can have a two bedroom, one bath home on your property. It runs for a $1,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something uh, crazy. Probably more here. What more, is it? What is it? A two bedroom, one bath probably rents in Hawaii. Like 226. Okay. okay. I was thinking yeah. per bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, per bedroom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah per hey, you're right yeah. on. That's yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> We think of everything in terms of per bedroom. Well, that is so cool. I love your mission. I love your heart. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, your wisdom with us and with the audience. I really appreciate it. And so we're just grateful to have you. 